Welcome to the Be What You Want podcast. My name is Chris Hall, your host, and today we've got Tom Hardwick on. He is the founder of the Guardian Early Learning Group, which is a group of companies, it's a group company that owns more than 100 childcare centers across Australia. Tom and I met at a conference a couple of years ago, um, and I've always been fascinated to get him on the podcast so that we can start talking about some of the strategies and also the personal journey in terms of what it's been like to truly build and manage and lead a group company that's got so many different geographies and variations going on um, across a nation. So um, yeah, with no further ado, Tom, welcome to the podcast. It really is a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, mate. Um, now, I always like to go back to origins. Now, originally at the beginning of your career, you had eight years in law um, and then you went into investment banking. So we've got the whole legal and the crunching the numbers background. Um, I know that you co-founded Guardian back in 2004 um, with some colleagues, and then it was actually six years later in 2010 that you came in as CEO. Um, from an investment point of view, what originally attracted you to investing into the, the childcare industry in Australia? Um, I need to thank my wife um, for our position where we are today. My wife left school and got into childcare by becoming a mother craft nurse. And in 1997, the two of us bought our first childcare centre together. And it was, um, it was tough. Um, you know, we nearly spent all the money in the first three months and um, nearly went broke, but we managed to hold it together. And then we had a few children and it was getting too hard to have two children under three and try to run a childcare business, etc. So um, we sold that childcare centre in 1999, subsequently moved to Sydney, and it was really in the early 2000s that ABC started to emerge and, and, and the concept of corporatised childcare became a little bit more um, interesting. And it was really in that context of sort of as an investment banker, having an interest in childcare given our past, um, studying the emergence of ABC and Peppercorn that we started to think that maybe we could do something in childcare and, and call it a Mark II version of childcare was when we started a management company as opposed to actually owning centres. Yeah, right. That's interesting. And for the, for, the, for the viewers and listeners around the world, what is ABC in Australia? Sure. ABC was a um, childcare company that I think put together about 20 or 30 childcare centres privately and then became a public company probably in 2001 or 2002. And then over the um, course of the next five or six years, grew to become the largest childcare company in the world with nearly 1,500 centres before it um, uh, fell victim to excessive growth and tightening debt conditions in the build up to the GFC. Wow, okay, that's interesting. So there was a whole evolution um, of the industry that occurred um, yeah, in the early yes. 2000s, basically. And that's, I'm yes. sure with your investment banker hat on, you saw what was changing combined indeed with your background with your wife. Um, by the way, yeah. I completely relate to how you feel with having a two under three. That's me right now with a two and a half year old and a four month year old. So um, yes, well, <laughs> enjoy that, Christopher. I'm on the back end of that. I have a 19, 18 and 15 year old. So that still has its moments too, I assure you. <laughs> I, well, I, I, know, I already know the wisdom that it never ends. Um, I'm for sure, right. definitely just lapping it all up. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. part of the journey um, in terms of setting up Guardian Early Learning Group was that you actually acquired 17 centers in one hit from an institutional investor. Um, I'm guessing that maybe some of your connections in investment banking um, either that led to that opportunity or you, you know, can you tell us about that a little bit more? Because you must have been, you've got to have a certain willingness and also a certain perspective to go, I'll just buy 17. <laughs> um, it, well, look, it was probably a little bit different to that because um, actually it was an investment banking client of mine who I had a relationship with who said, we see what you're doing in childcare. And at that point, we were a management company. So we didn't actually own our own centres. We were um, um, managing centres on behalf of absent owners who paid us a fee to run their centre. A bit like the hotel industry management model there. And over the course of 2005 through 2007, 
we actually acquired those 17 centres for this institutional landlord, which was a property group. Um, so they essentially gave us the money to buy these centres that we ran on their behalf with a view that we might create an investment fund for their retail investors um, in the future. So um, we then hit 2008 with the financial crisis and this property group had to tidy up its balance sheet and sort of get back to its core focus of commercial property. Childcare was a bit of an ancillary um, investment for it. And so we were faced with our largest management client wanting to sell its centres and we as a management business risked losing you know, a core part of our business if this was to proceed. And so um, and it was a difficult time to sell assets in the aftermath of the financial crisis because it was very difficult for people to get money or have any money to buy assets and therefore the prices had diminished. So it was at that time um, that we, the management company, essentially found a private equity firm to give us the capital we needed to buy this, seven, this portfolio of 17 assets from our largest client. So one shored up our management business, but really it was the turning point for Guardian because at that point we became an owner of centres rather than just a manager of centres so that all of the hard work we did in trying to make centres run better, those extra earnings that resulted from that effort came to us mm. rather than go to the managed client absent owner. So that, that deal settled, um, it was Christmas Eve in uh, 2010 and we had a couple of landlords that were trying to green mail us and we, so we had to play a game. But we eventually got everything over the line in, um, on Christmas Eve 2010 so that from the start of 2011, mm -hmm. Guardian in its current form came into existence. It was no longer just a manager of centres, it was an owner of centres and a manager. And we could then put all of our effort into the 17 centres that we own to get them to improve their performance. And, and over, the, over the years, those 17 centres, when we bought them in 2010, probably made about $4.5 million in earnings. Today, those same 17 centres probably make $12 million in earnings. So we've really you know, had fantastic success growing those businesses. And um, a couple of years ago, we decided to exit the management business because we felt it was in some ways, we were getting relatively low management fees for a lot of effort to run someone's centre. Mm. And we felt that if we put all of that effort into just the centres that we own for ourselves, we would get a much better return. And that's what subsequently proved to be the case. Wow, what a fascinating journey. Um, so th there's often an economic opportunity in a crisis, which is what you described. Yes. And from a strategic evolution point of view, I'm to kind of wind it back, because you've gone from everything from being a management company to then transitioning to being a management plus ownership, reaping the rewards from that. And then indeed, yeah. the, I suppose the ironic twist is that even though you started off as a, my, I, as a management only company, by becoming an owner and just whatever, growing that way, you actually then left management. So, I mean, when you originally set it up, did you did you have a vision of owning in the future at a certain point or was it, generally speaking, we intended, what were your intentions at first? I'm interested. Um, look, our intentions, it was five guys who got together and saying we should do something in childcare. It's a bit like what it has been in Australia the last year or two where every man, every man woman and their dogs think that they can make money out of childcare and they want to get into childcare. Right. It was a bit like that in the early to mid 2000s. So we said, well, we should do something in childcare. Why don't we either buy a centre or build a centre? We had some property guys and another guy with some childcare experience. So we sort of set off to do that. Now, in hindsight, it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. Um, because you don't make a lot of money being a manager and it was hard work and, but yeah, you know, it also it was it was the business we got into. We made it work. We learned a lot through that process, and really, I suppose in some ways we learned using other people's capital mm -hmm. because they weren't our centres; they were someone else's centres that we were learning on. And then maybe by the time two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine came around, we sort of had got our act together so that when we eventually bought that first seventeen centres from our largest client, 
we actually really transformed those centres and really got some good earnings growth from them. So, um, yes, and I'm sure there's lots of people who have started up businesses that go in expecting a certain direction and end up doing something quite different. And that was the case for us. Although, interestingly, we eventually came back to the ownership model, mm. you know, five or six years later. Yeah, wow. Um, there's, there's strategically, again, it's interesting. It's a very, it's a wise old story that you can have the wonderful VIP diamond client that gives you, say, 70% of your revenue and you love them because they, they're regular, they pay well, yeah. et cetera. But of course, something can change always. They can either go to someone else, the economy can change, et cetera. Um, yeah. So there's, there's, there's that wise old wisdom in, in you know, diversification, of course. But what's fascinating about your story is that you literally turned the, well, the crisis into an economic, economic opportunity, but also that challenge of essentially losing the diamond VIP customer. You actually just completely turned on its head and said, well, let's just completely benefit from this, take the, all the rewards that we know that they're getting and we've got good at this anyway. So let's just, <laughs> I love it. You just completely flipped it on its head and, and uh, were bold uh, whilst the rest of the world was kind of melting down. Um, yeah. So yeah. What a, what a, what a fascinating rising from the ashes and actually just flipping it on its head while you were doing it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do say to um, people that I talk to about, you know, our past and, you know, young people who are looking you know, what do they do with themselves and their careers, etc. And I do, I'm a firm believer, I was lucky enough to work in a couple of big companies early in the process, like Course Chambers Westgarth is a national law firm. And, you know, you get to rotate and work in different parts of the firm. You get fantastic training. Um, and I, I think that's really critical in the early stages of your career to get, you know, diversified experiences, good training, work with really smart people, you know, work really hard, but, you know, you really learn from that. Mm. But then um, you need to have the courage to jump off the, out of the comfort zone and, and into the choppy ocean every now and again and back yourself to go into new ventures. And, you know, I, I left law and I went and did some management consulting in the US and back here, which worked out pretty well. Um, I went back to law for a short time frame and then realised that I didn't like law anymore and I didn't want to be a partner in a law firm for the rest of my life. I wanted to do something a bit more entrepreneurial. But I still needed to develop some skills, the, the art of persuasion, a bit more you know, engagement, um, you know, show a bit more emotion and passion. Because as a lawyer, you're a bit more of an expert consultant that people come to to solve their technical problems. So I had to develop some skills that I, I did a bit of coaching and identified a few weaknesses. And so I jumped out of law into a, um, a fairly new, um, probably call it a startup logistics um, third party provider business, which was completely outside of my domain. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and that business went broke within a year because the guy was growing it too quickly and um, wasn't pricing his, his services appropriately. So then I had the whole experience of a company winding up and, um, you know, shutting sites and dealing with receivers. And, and that was almost my MBA that year because it was an incredibly difficult year. Oh, yeah. But, you know, when, when you go through that process and see the back end or the train wreck of a business, you mm -hmm. sort of learn a lot about what not to do when you're setting up the business in the first place. So, so while I jumped out of a partnership in a law firm for that experience, which failed, it was still an incredible experience. And then that opened up the door for me to come to Sydney and get into investment banking in early 2000, when in the aftermath of the tech wreck, it wasn't easy to get jobs in investment banking, but because of a relationship, I was able to do that. And, and even that first job in investment banking didn't really work so well, um, just because of the time and the nature of the firm. And we, in the middle of a large corporate transaction, um, should decide to change firms and back ourselves to start up again in another firm. And, and that worked really well. That was really great a couple of years for me. And then, um, and then after a while, I got a bit restless and then you know, jumped into property funds management and then ultimately had the courage to jump into Guardian full time, which at that point, it was a pretty small business, taking on private equity for the first time. So um, it's, it's those moments in your life where you, you have a choice as to whether you stay in the comfort zone or you push yourself and you go in, into new territories. And it does mean you sometimes have to go and do some study after hours. And we had young children. My wife used to take them down the beach and I was studying mergers and acquisitions and capital raisings on the weekend. And so you just have to do all that stuff. But I've found, you know, one, 
it keeps life interesting, but two, that variety of experience ultimately I think gave me a really great base to be a CEO of a, com- of a high growth company, mm-hmm. dealing with acquisition issues, staff lead, you know, management leadership issues, shareholder, stakeholder management, all of those types of things. Um, I feel, you know, have been successful at it because of the breadth of what I did when I was younger and that, that willingness to take a bit of a risk and try something new. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And um, before I'm doing, but before I did my current business, now I did four other businesses, and and uh, I, I've used that phrase as well. Like that was my MBA because it was my first six years of entrepreneurship, and it was everything from nearly going bankrupt to having to deal with you know strategic shifts and all that good stuff. And and you, I, I literally know that I had to go through the fire, go through all that stuff um, to. In what one <coughs> to me was the embodiment, the embodiment of knowing what it, how tough it can feel in a crisis. Because mm. if you can know how tough it can feel, um, I think that you literally embody almost the place that you don't want to go in the future and your future yeah. businesses. Do you see what I mean? Like you, you, you in that 3PL yeah. business, for example, you know, poor oh man, I know what it was like to deal with the receivers and I can know what to spot maybe mm. you know, 12 months in advance. Therefore, I just kind of, it's almost like a threshold point emotionally where you go, Oh man, I know, I know what can lead to that. And I don't want to go there again because I've learned, you know, by going through the fires, so like there's the embodiment aspect. Of course, there are the, um, the intellectual strategic insights. Um, and it's just good old fashioned experience in terms of, um, yeah, the entrepreneurial journey is that often you, you're going to go through many, 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 challenges failures and it's just about how quickly you pick yourself up again so that you can implement it again you have to be quite um quite bloody minded don't you and a dog with a bone and mm-hmm. just keep going until you get it right um yeah. resilient and determined that's it and, and and it's a it can be lonely can't it because in those darker moments where you know it's challenging in the early days in particular you know that there's no one else. And, and again, I, I know this and accept this now after doing it for, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only seven years into uh, being my own business owner. But, you know, I, I also know and accept now that it's only ever you really deep, deep, deep down, like as the, maybe the main founder, especially if you're a solopreneur, that will have either the vision and the grit to see it through because no one else will have that enthusiasm or the vision. Um, yeah. 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 No, absolutely. There's a um, there's a book. I can't quite remember the name of the guy. He started one of the big um, Silicon Valley VC firms, but I think it's called the Hard Things About Hard Things, and it's a uh, nice. story of getting through the um, the tech crisis of the late, you know, early two thousands. And it's just a, a horrible read in terms of how hard it was for this guy to just keep the business afloat and to get it through and. Re, reposition the business and it's a great read for all entrepreneurs I think because yeah. it is a bloody hard thing and you have to have that real fire in your belly to, to get through it because yeah. um, you know really only founders have that um, mm. and, not, and not even all founders have it but yeah so uh, no mm-hmm. resilience and, uh, um, and, a, and a good spine are definitely <laughs> prerequisites for the role of entrepreneur Oh, a hundred percent. And um, sorry to interrupt you. Then I apologise. Um, the, 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 but also, good old-fashioned professional experience. Like I had six years in a uh, IT consultancy company, and whether it be in you know law, uh, accounting, IT, investment banking, just something where you've got breadth of experience and also, um, yeah, development. Because often the big companies that when you go work for them, they can they can rapidly get you to a certain level of professionalism. So that you know, yeah. by the time that you found your first company for the first time, you already know what you're talking about to a reasonable extent. Um, yeah. The other thing I'd say, Chris, which I've seen is that I've seen people who have sort of left school and got into industries, and maybe not done, you know, a lot of study or postgraduate work mm-hmm. and or haven't really worked in big companies where they get exposure to what mm-hmm. great looks like and training and support, et cetera. I have found along the journey that they tend to tap out as you're growing a business that their capability taps out as, as businesses gets to certain sizes. And, you know, I think mine, once we got to a hundred centers, I think mine was starting to tap out because, you know, I haven't run a business with a hundred 
sites and 3,000 people and you know you need systems and structures and processes at that point whereas but I think a lot of other people along the journey fell out a lot sooner because yeah. they just didn't have enough big company experience and, and system support etc and so mm. so I do think you know if you're going to get on those journeys um, the, the, the stronger the foundation the, mm. the, the greater the chance of success down the track Absolutely. And um, I had a wonderful business coach that coached me for two years. And um, she said to me, again, it's from like a founder's point of view, if you imagine like a, a, a pyramid, a triangle, you're at the top of it. As the founder, you are always your business. Um, and what can be a challenge at first is that as you get to say year three or four, you might have someone that joined you in the beginning that, you know, is not the right fit anymore, or doesn't have that experience, etc. And as the founder, they can in your early days, there can be this perhaps a guilt over like, oh God, you know, but they've been with me since the beginning, are they right, could they go, could I ever, you know, what would, what would that mean? But the point is, is that as your business grows, um, you are always at the top, generally speaking, with the vision and the business is essentially you. Of course, you add systems and processes to it, um, but it is essentially you in terms of the, the energy and the vision. Um, and you've got to be willing, here's my point, you've got to be willing to bring new people on to that pyramid along the way and also sometimes like people organically move on to the next thing because they can't, not everyone is meant to join you along the whole length of that journey. And I think some people you recruit and, you know, they're good for the time, but they can't make the whole journey, which is yep. fine. Yep. There are, I, I recruited people that I knew and some were friends, some were past colleagues, etc., and they were fine at the time. Um, and also it was helpful to have some people around the joint that you trusted because also you mm. sort of have more generalists when you're smaller and you just need people to help do stuff. And so having people you trust and know, you know, makes that easier. Um, but, you know, I, I had to have the conversations with a lot of those people at various points to say, look, you know, it's now not, no longer working. I need a specialist in this area, et cetera. And, and they're obviously really hard conversations, mm. particularly some of these people are lifelong friends. Now, Fortunately, in most cases, I've been able to retain the friendship despite been having those difficult conversations. So um, that's been probably means we did it in a reasonable way. Um, but um, you definitely need to turn some people over on the journey. It's never nice. It's never easy. But it's the reality that um, you have to blend the people who come on early who really buy into the vision and are really mm. passionate about it and work their backsides off for it. Mm as well as then bringing in new people who have got that bigger company or bigger, more better systems and mm -hmm. process and bigger organisational experience. And then you've got to try and blend the two together because when you bring people in from outside, it often fails because they can't handle the entrepreneurial, yes. um, the looseness of the environment, yes. the sort of the chaotic nature of it, particularly if you're growing at a fairly rapid rate. Yep. And so it's hard for those guys to come on board. I say you're getting on board a treadmill that's going at 10 and we're lifting the elevation of it. So you have no time to settle in, no time to shuffle paper. And you've got to sort of blend together with these people who are really passionate, who may not be the sort of workers that you're used to working with yes. because they're a bit all over the shop. But trust me, they've, <laughs> they've got the fire in their belly. So that... Um, process of how you grow how you retain the culture but how you improve the business to address the problems that it, that it encounters as it gets bigger mm. it's a really you know it's a fine line to walk and to try to make successful exactly and i think it's that walking that line is the perfect way to describe it because um the idea of permanence in structure or permanence in people is a complete illusion um and there's a dance between different forces of entrepreneurship and standardization that indeed carry up be willing to walk that walk and dance the dance because that's how you keep basically able to be running on that treadmill as a company um, yeah. fascinating okay now actually let me just jump to systems and procedures I'm, I'm, I'm interested so on the pure ownership side you've got more than 100 centers in terms of the way that just out of interest like do you run the the back end of everything i.e for example anything from customer relationship management to 
you know, the accountancy of every single center? Is it all run completely uniformly, um, you know, to, in order to be able to manage 100 centers plus, or do you allow um, a lot of variation within each center? Um, I'd say we sort of have a loose, tight structure. Um, our model, so of the 100 centres, we've acquired 80 and opened 20. So we, our early model was buy great centres and make them better, you know, mm -hmm. good to great kind of concept. And then um, once we got big enough and we could take the risk or the profit and loss hit of opening a centre you know, while it's ramping up, we started to do some green fields from about four or five years ago. So, um, uh, so when we've bought centres, we've typically had it in the early stages a quite a light touch approach because if you're buying great centres, they're great for a reason. So, you know, our transition strategies basically don't stuff up something that we're buying because it's already good. So let's not try to guardianise it too early. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, we need sort of the same centre management invoicing system and debtors system and so the administration platform is consistent across the group mm -hmm. um, there might be some times where they're using a different you know rostering system or, or or something where we might give them three or six months to transition across but the administration and finance platform is all one um, consistent platform mm -hmm. and typically what we've done is picked best of breed applications for different parts of the business. So we don't have a, um, you know, an enterprise system where it's all pulled together, but rather we have a system for the centre manager and a system for accounting, a system for, you know, collecting hours and paying people and all those different things. Um, what, where we've been more laissez-faire is probably in, in the, the nature of the service that we provide at the centre. Okay. We're not a, it's not like McDonald's where it's the same mm. approach in every centre. Um, we've sort of said, well, if that centre has a particular culture, it has a particular education, educational ethos, if the families in the community really buy into the centre, mm. well, let's not muck it up too much. So mm. leave it alone. Um, probably over time, we felt that that's fine, but as centre managers leave or there's some staff changes, then in some ways you lose a bit of the IP of yes. the centre. And so we have sort of developed a more consistent approach to curriculum and pedagogical practice that I'd call more of a Buddhist approach than a Catholic approach. So it's not thou shalt do this, this and this, but rather here are the principles, here are the things we believe in, this is what we like to see in our centres. And then we give them the freedom within their own local community or context as to best apply them. So it's sort of that's the kind of model we've tried to put in place. And obviously, as you get bigger, you probably need a bit more system and process and structure than you had in the early days. Yeah. But at the same time, I still think that concept of we're more Buddhist than we are Catholic is a good, simple way of depicting what we're trying to do. Wow, wow, wow. Um, now, with, the, with that, interestingly, from um, a branding point of view, um, with that 80-20 split, approximately, yeah. I would imagine the, the, the 20 new centres that you've built are branded consistently, is that correct? Yes, we, um, about two or three years ago, we felt that it was time to look at branding because you know, when we've acquired centres in the past, why change the name if they're great centres? Mm -hmm. um, why confuse people? Um, but as, uh, particularly with the um, advent of digital marketing, mm -hmm. you know, it became inefficient to have 80 different websites and mm -hmm. trying to do Facebook pages and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, we need to move towards a brand. And I also think there's now um, a certain culture and consistency across Guardian that underpins a brand, you know, because a brand is really, I'm a believer in building a brand from the inside out. What is it? in this business that you want to communicate to the outside world that makes it so great that mm. people want to then align to. And so we've spent quite a bit of time trying to define and depict that and, you know, come up with, you know, should we change the name? Should we keep the name? What mm. sort of, you know, how do we rep depict ourselves? I think our logo at the moment is quite corporate in its sort of presentation. So we're looking as to how we make it more, more of a family oriented um, logo, et cetera. So, um, we are definitely moving down the path of rebranding to a, a common brand. 
some of those acquisitions might be rebranded early in the piece and others might retain their brand for a year or two and then flick over down the track. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I think, and, and therefore the green fields are all branded Guardian. Um, mm-hmm. Just as we get the, the brand structure and naming conventions, they mm-hmm. might change a little bit, but yeah, we've been doing that. Yeah, that's an interesting point about the, uh, the, the advent of digital marketing in particular, because it's so true. I think a lot of people expect nowadays, don't they, to have all of the bells and whistles. Like I remember one of the centers that we put our son in, um, they had uh, an app, I think it was called the Explorer app or whatever, and it's just a piece of software. I'm sure many centers might use it, but the point is, is that you could check in your child, they would write up little notes, everything from had a nappy change to, you know, here's a picture of your son playing after lunch all that kind of stuff like it's a lot of it's a lot of tech and yeah if you got if you've got a hundred different ways of doing it i can imagine that adds to the admin but also yeah it's interesting because there's a there's a relationship there isn't there between the administration of you know for the sake of argument a hundred different ways of doing things um to the consistency of you know when you said like what's the brand trying to communicate even if it's branded something else it's the customer's experience of your company right so you don't want to yeah, it's interesting. You want to make it consistently a excellent experience, don't you? So, yeah, yes. I, I, can, I think there's the, it's interesting, isn't it? The the um, the transition towards consistency um, it ensures that excellent customer experience over time, because otherwise, you know, you don't want to you don't want to forget any little one way of doing things because you've got a hundred different ways of doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, and. It, it doesn't sort of matter when you're that small, you know, mm-hmm. with geographic diversity, but just as you can get bigger and you've got 40 centres around Sydney, then people do know that that's a Guardian centre or Guardian this or Guardian that. And so it is, um, you know, you need to define some brand standards. And then, you know, the next job is to educate all of our people about them and, and bring them to life, which is also not easy because the sector does have, you know, reasonably high staff turnover and, um, you know, our, our educators are in for children rather than the corporate or the brand or um, so, um, and, you know, just finding time to get access to people because, you know, we're required by law to have ratios oh, yeah. um, of, you know, for every next children you have staff. Ever. And so finding the time to get staff available for training that's not at night time or on weekend, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's quite challenging so, um, yeah, I think we've, we've done the hard yards of sort of coming up with the brand concept, the rollout plan, but, you know, the next challenge is really how you embed that in 3,000 people across 100 sites that, you know, growing and bringing new people on. So it, it is, it's not easy. I want to tap into the brand and the value stuff a bit more in a second, but before I do, let me wind back 14 years and go back to 2004. When you set up Guardian, the word Guardian, out of interest, was it with a focus on we are a guardian of your childcare centre because we're a management company, um, or was it more towards we're a guardian in terms of the guardianship of the care of children? What was the idea there? Uh, no, I, th- I think it was a bit of both. I think it was a bit of the relationship with our, our owner clients, mm. the relationship we had with uh, our, the children and, and their families. And, yeah, this concept. And back then... It was more child care rather than sort of early years learning. You know, it was um, um, looking after children while people went to work. And then, you know, over the course of the last 14 years, I think people have started to say, mm-hmm. hey, children, their brains develop pretty rapidly in those first five years of life and they're spending more and more time in child care centres mm-hmm. um, as parents are working and uh, you know, dual income families have emerged. You know, the female workforce participation rates really increased significantly over that period. So, you know, the government said, look, if we're, if we're going to have this sector, we need to think about how it becomes more focused on the educational and development aspects as well as the care fact, you know, the care aspects. And so, um, you know, there has been quite a transformation in the regulatory environment, the staffing requirements, the qualification requirements. So, um, you know, I think we've come a long way. And, and in many ways, I question whether the name Guardian is truly reflective of what we do today because it is very much, I depict it as 
the or interpreted as the adult protector of children or your guardian the protector mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and i think we've moved beyond that um but i think after 14 years you know your name and your brand it sort of emerges yes based on history and what you've done and, and so i think we felt that it wasn't it, it didn't we didn't need to change the name we could bring in the concept of our approach to early learning and it's more than just childcare through other through other means well yeah i mean and you've got early learning group in the you know guardian yes. early learning group within that the, for the learning aspect and i mean just to just to mirror back to you on that concern i have to like pay you guys a compliment in the sense of like as a parent putting my son at two and a half years old under the care of someone else for the day I quite like the word guardian because it, yeah, I like that protector element because, you know, um, that gives us, I think, reassurance. Um, yes. As well as well, if, it's a, it's, if you, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a, as a, as a paradigm, yeah. from a parent's point of view, yes. the number one issue is the safety of my child, yes. um, the, the care, the, the warmth of the educators, someone knows who they are, someone knows who I am. So there's that primary sort of need when you visit the centre. Oh, yeah. And particularly for younger children, you're not too concerned about their educational development in the early stages. Possibly when they're, you know, they're four and they're, you're starting to think about school, then, you know, the educational um, piece becomes a bit more relevant. But, mm. um, uh, but yeah, a, parent, a parent's prime concern. And sometimes as a sector, we just have to be a little bit conscious of that. And, oh, yeah. and if you look at... Um, if you look at the Google Analytics, mm -hmm. you know, the vast, vast majority of people are doing searches on childcare near me or you know, childcare Balmain or whatever mm -hmm. suburb, rather than early learning centres or early learning. So, mm -hmm. um, which reflects you know, parents' primary need yep. for their child to be safe, protected, yes. strong relationships, etc. And then the learning is secondary. I think people are looking for that, but mm -hmm. it's the secondary need rather than the primary need. I think the Maslow um, uh, analogy is actually perfect. Yeah, you must first of all fulfill the need of um, the protector, you know, safe, nurtured mm -hmm. environment, and only after that point, and also as they age, um, yeah. yeah, they go on to the the more the blossoming stage of mental development as well as social development. I mean, I again yeah. to add to that, we pulled our son from a centre that we didn't we didn't see a happy little boy at the end of the day when he was there, and we felt it was little emotionally neglectful and etc whereas the places are now love it it feels like you're dropping him off at his grandma's house you know there's such a, yeah. such care there and that's just beautiful um tapping into the brand thing uh, a bit more, in terms of core values um what are the core values of the group and why are they important to to the group um it was something we developed you know, because of my consulting background, we developed it reasonably early in the piece, but, you know, it has refined a little bit over time. And, um, you know, I think the values are, I, I sort of see them as um, what are the sort of behaviours that we see around the place that you need to be comfortable with to survive or thrive in this environment? Um, some of them were just naturally what happens in our sector so passion you know you you don't come and work in the childcare sector for money you come and working because you're pretty passionate about children and their development and their education so mm -hmm. so you need to be passionate about this and 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 the people who work in this sector it is a lovely sector because they really you know we have a wonderful product which is children young children and their development it's not like we're trying to move a pair of jeans from a factory in China to a shop here and you know, sell it for the best price. We're working with young children who are you know, the most important thing in the lives of their parents. And so it is, um, it's a wonderful space to be in, but you have to be pretty passionate about it. It's a hard job. You know? I'm sure when you've dropped your um, children off at a centre, you look at those um, it's primarily young ladies and go, wow, eight hours a day on their feet with Ooh. children, Ooh. 15, 20 minute break, half hour, 40 minute lunch break. And, you know, they don't get to go and read the Fin Review and have a nice cup of coffee in the local cafe when things get a bit hard. They're, they are on the whole time. So, oh, yeah. so passion was something that I'd say was a reflection of who we were rather than necessarily a directive of who we should be. So mm. let's call 
recognition um, is something that our guys are always looking to be recognised for the great work they're doing. And, you know, that's one of the great things the digital platforms have provided. Um, we use Facebook for work, you know, so they can share all the great things they're doing with children and, you know, seek support or assistance from their colleagues, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you know, the team spirit is, you know, you work in a, in a room of people, you know, three or four educators in a room with 10 to 20 children. You, you have to get on, you have to work together and, and the rooms have to be able to collaborate with each other to ensure the whole centre works well. And, and we, in the support office, need to be engaged with our centres and support them. So it, it, it does require a real team effort to um, be successful at this and obviously that's one of our values. I probably, um, as a founder, impose the values of sort of honesty and respect. I think it's important for what we do. You know, we have things go wrong in our centres. There's lots of human beings in our centres, both staff, parents and children and so things do happen and we need to you know we're regulated we have to report those so honesty is very important maybe it's my catholic upbringing that, that makes it so such an issue for me but i just feel in a, a large organization with lots of people lots of regulations we just need to be open and honest in how we communicate conflict emerges a lot well okay let's not bury it and suppress it and just wait for it to blow up down the track let's try and get it on the table and resolve it let's think about how we're a bit more respectful in our interaction with each other so some of those you know how we behave with each other and then um, one that probably drives everyone crazy is, is excellence if you're going to do something do it well and um and that's something that you know that it's a really a personal value of mine that i've tried to install in the organisation um, um, because, you know, you only get one life and mm. you may as well have a real crack at it. And mm. um, so if you're going to do something, do it well. So they're the sorts of, you know, half a dozen values that have guided us to this point. Yep. Maybe sort of going forward, um, they might be something that we think about and review. But, yeah, I think they'll probably stand the test of time as the essence of the Guardian culture. I, I think that's beautifully said, actually, all of it. And it sounds like it's a lovely blend of suitability towards industry that you're in, as you said, um, plus, of course, that, that, that spirit of um, your energy, um, you know, of the honesty um, and excellence piece in particular, like, a, you know, as well as everything else. Like, I love that blend. Now, in terms of anyone that is considering either expanding their current business or indeed just going into this idea of being an expansive group company, uh, whether it be an owner operator or just setting up multiple brands and having that group structure. What, what, um, what advice would you give to anyone that wants to truly become a group company? Um, well, I think, I do think it's a fantastic thing to do. You know, people, because in what we do, buying buying little businesses, I call it diseconomies of scale. So there's no real cost synergies in buying a childcare centre. There's there's the ad additional costs. We have to pay higher rates of payroll tax because we get no threshold when we buy a smaller business, and that's that can be two percent of your revenue, the payroll tax in cost. So that's material. Mm. You have to then put you know, overhead in the sense of area managers that keep an eye on the centre. Uh, and typically when a centre's gone from a, you know, a ma and pa operator or a good owner to a corporate, some families get a bit concerned and, and you can lose occupancy. Mm -hmm. You could lose a few staff and that upsets the parents. So typically when we buy a centre, we go backwards. Um, mm -hmm. The trick is not to go backwards too much. Mm -hmm. And then to have a very strong plan as to what you can do to improve that business. And I think we've been pretty good at that going into centres and having a clear plan um, for how we can improve it. And then over the next 12 or 18 months, 12 to 24 months, really work on that. We try to be fairly hands off the first six to 12 months because we don't want to upset the apple cart. But then, you know, we have our plan. We then look at it, understand it once we've owned the asset and then we start to make some changes a year or so down the track. Um, and I think that's um, really critical if you're going to buy something, one that you know it's going to be tough and it may go sideways or backwards in the early mm -hmm. stages 
but you have a clear plan as to how you can grow the value of that asset over time. Um, and, you know, I saw Justin Hemi speak this week about Merrivale and, you know, his, you know, what he's been doing in terms of buying pubs that are good pubs, but then he makes some great pubs and he has a very strong vision when he goes and sees those assets and, and then the team really executes behind him once he's acquired the asset. So, um, so I'd say that. I'd say, um, you know, we've probably made a few mistakes. You know, maybe sometimes you get a bit caught up in the quest for a deal and pay a bit too much for an asset or, or, you, or you say it's the profit's X when really it's X minus mm. Y. Um, so you've got to be a bit careful not to get too emotionally connected to deals. Um, mm. I, I find it easier to buy a centre and transition it and improve it than it is to do a greenfield. You know, greenfields in our sector are, are, are really challenging to do. Okay. And, and it can take you three or four years to get to, to, to you know, steady state profitability because right. your cost in the early stages are, are much higher. So now a lot of people are in the retail game. It's easy to open a retail store yep. and have your fit out and all that stuff. So it's more courses for courses, but in, in our sense, um, I found um, acquisitions easier than, than greenfields. I think um, you get to, as you're scaling up, and, and most of these um, aggregations, pl aggregation plays do fail. You know, if you look back at accountants have tried to roll up, doctors have tried to roll up, um, financial planners, you know, there's lots of different groups that have done these roll ups and, most of them, you know, in the childcare sector, most people who have listed on the stock market, use public funds to go and buy assets and to scale up, have typically failed because they grow so quickly that the earnings of the centres they acquire go backwards and then people are losing money. So, so it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, and then I think the other thing, there's kind of step changes in the need from the support office. So the size of the support office obviously grows. Mm -hmm. But you sort of get to certain points where, hey, we need a whole new accounting system because the one we've had that got us through the first 20 or 30 businesses can't mm -hmm. handle 100 sites. Mm -hmm. So we've got to do that. And, and they're big projects when you change, um, you know, major pieces of software. Payroll, you know, you have a payroll system that can suit you when you're younger, but all of a sudden you've got a couple of thousand people, you need something with a bit more grunt to it. So um, so it's not, it's not an easy process, um, but... For us, we've been pretty successful, I think, through the acquisition model. Um, and the the green fields have been some cream on the top. So to give you an example, we might pay five or six times the earnings to buy an existing business. If we were to do a greenfield development, it might be at a capital cost of two or three times the earnings. So it's far more equity accretive transaction. Okay. But it can take you three or four years to get to that steady state profitability and you know you can have a whole lot of hiccups along the way. So yeah. um I think finding a, a balance is probably the right, right answer. Yeah, five to six is an interesting ratio. That's interesting to know because um I when I saw my business last year, I, I went to business brokers and I just want to add on a couple of there's so many pearls of wisdom in what you said. So for everyone watching and listening mm -hmm rewind and listen to everything that Tom just said again, because it was absolutely genius. Um, I remember when I went to um, a business broker and saw my previous business, they said, you know, the, the multiplier of, the, you know, profit um, earnings times, you know, um, the, the, what you want to pay for the business. Um, it, it depends on the business very much. And they, their words were, you know, hey, it might be for a whatever business, there's nothing special. It might be two to three times for a post office. A post office might be 4.5 times earnings because, mm -hmm because they've got kind of a tied up almost monopoly on a geography, like there's only one local post office in your town. And um, so that's why it's a bit higher. Um, so that's interesting to me that you can pay up to five to six times earnings for a, for a learning center. I suppose it's, um, what is it that gives it such a relatively high value? Is it that, is it almost like the, the, the tied up nature of the geographical base combined with, you know, um, the steady flow of kids on the intake? Is that, what is it that gives it that kind okay. of there's a range of things. Yeah, you know, I think at the moment childcare centres are in reasonable demand, so that 
mm. pushes up the prices. You know, I've paid three to four times for centres, mm. you know, in 2009, 2010, when no one had money to buy centres. So they mm. were the good times. Mm. Um, but then when the when everyone wants to get into the sector, then it's obviously you're paying a bit more. I think the multiples have come back from where they were 18 months ago. But mm. still, to, to buy a really good quality centre, you're still looking at five, five and a half times. Um, I think the reason why is... You know, two thirds of our gov- uh, two thirds of our revenue is underwritten by the federal government. So, in yes. some ways, that nice. that helps. Yes. But it also, it's also a business where you have um, lots of small customers. So you don't have one big contract. You know, one big client with a big contract. If they said mine could destroy the value of your business. So we have lots of little mm. customers. Mm. Um, and yeah, you know, I think it's a stable business. You know, mm. people generally need childcare for most of the year, oh, yeah. um, and you know, use two or three days a week. They put their children in childcare, and, and so it's so it's not um, it's not very racy. It's not hey, we're, if you look at retail, hey, we've we've gone off and bought a whole lot of stock from overseas, thinking this will be successful in autumn, and yet if it's a um, if it's a long hot summer then they've missed their mark on the autumn range or, you know, or, they, or they've chosen the wrong range. Well, yeah, that can have a really significant impact on your business and therefore the multiples that people will pay for that because your profits are up and down so much. Mm. Whereas ours, is, it's a much more steady um, environment, which therefore drives a higher multiple. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And one of the things I also learned when so- selling my business is that, um, is that people very, well, some, it's, it's common for the buyer of a business not to want to buy the legal entity and just to want to buy the trading uh, and the branding mm-hmm. and, the, and all the intellectual property, et cetera. So like in layman's terms, someone doesn't want to buy the proprietary limited, but they want to buy everything else. Um, yeah. Is that a similar sort of journey that you guys typically go on? You'll take, you'll take everything else apart from the, all the, all the history of the terms of the PTY. Yeah. Look, um, most of the businesses we've bought, we've just bought the business rather than the entity. Yes. Um, yes. There have at different points in time being stamp duty advantages of buying the entity. Yes. Um, whereas with the business, you might have paid full stamp duty. You bought the shares in the entity, you paid minimal stamp duty. Mm-hmm. So at times we've bought the, the entity for that reason. At other times, it just, for whatever reason, suited us or the vendor to do the entity. Now, clearly when you buy the entity, you buy the history of the entity and that brings risk. So you seek to minimise that risk um, uh, by, you know, warranties, guarantees from the vendors. If the transaction is large enough, you can actually buy warranty insurance so that if the the vendor has no assets Mm -hmm. and you've got a claim against them based on the history of of the entity, you can get some insurance for that. Um, and then also what we look to do whenever it's legally possible is transfer, once the entity is owned by us, we'll transfer the assets out of the entity into our main entity and then we'll wind up the purchased entity so that we eliminate the risk of the past of that entity. And, and in some states, you have to hold it for 12 months and others it's three years. So it just varies a little bit as to what we yeah, very interesting. Sorry to get so technical. I've just had, I've had that recent experience, but I found it interesting to see the strategy yeah. of that at a group level. And I think it's um, easy. It's less risk to buy the business, but people shouldn't be afraid of buying the entity. It, it does make the transaction a lot simpler when you buy the entity, um, mm. but you do bring on some more risk. But I don't think you should um, run away from it, provided you've got some people help you do due diligence to you know protect your the risk it is about that due diligence and not knowing the reason you want to do it because um yeah that's interesting about the insurance i didn't know you could do that because um you know with the small mum and pop business that you might buy you know you you could give them say 200 grand for their business and then that 200 grand they just go and spend it on traveling the world you know so they don't have the money so you know, it's kind of it's necessary isn't it sometimes to take extra yeah measures. yeah yeah you yeah. probably for, for what it's worth, you probably need to be buying businesses probably above 10 million bucks yeah. to for the warranty insurance because it's quite a bit of work that they put into okay. the process. So, you know, they, everyone wants fees, Chris, and lawyers. And so it's got to be big enough for people to want to get out of bed so they That's can earn their fees. Okay. But, okay. Um, but it's, definitely, yeah. it's definitely a useful tool to be aware of um, yeah. if, you, if you're transacting in that size. 
be doing that kind of realm. Yeah, nice, nice. Now, um, you're a member of something called the Young Presidents Organization. We've mentioned it before with some previous podcast guests, um, the YPO. Um, so the YPO is a global organization. And if you are a leader of a business uh, earning a certain amount of revenue, um, you can be part of the Young Presidents Organization. So Tom, you're, you, I know that you're a member of that. And um, can you tell us about your passions? You know, what, why, why, what do you love about you know, being a member of the YPO? Look, I came to YPO quite late in the entrepreneurial journey and I definitely wish I had joined it earlier because it is, it's a tremendous organisation for entrepreneurs um, because of the support it provides people and, and in essence it provides support through two core mechanisms. One is a great education program both locally and overseas so you, you join a chapter and that chapter has basically one or two events every month that you can attend and it's could be an entrepreneur hosting a, a lunch for 10 people t sharing their story um you know and, and these are people that you wouldn't ord ordinarily get access to mm -hmm. and so and, and then globally ypo puts on a lot of events um you know i've done two events in silicon valley maybe 100 people entrepreneurs from around the world come to and a group of people have put together a program for three or four days, you know, visiting Facebook, Google, all the big Silicon Valley companies, etc. So um, there's great international um, educational events and there's great local ones. So I think that's a really great part of YPO. And they're all oriented towards entrepreneurialism, family. YPO is very big around the role of family for entrepreneurs and how you balance business and family. And, and personal development, health, well-being, etc. So those sort of three core pillars. Um, and the other thing that YPO does, um, which is pretty unique, is create this concept called Forum. And in essence, it puts eight to ten people in a group that meets once a month and you must make the meetings. It's entirely confidential. You can't even talk to your wife or anyone about what goes on in Forum. Right. And it's a really safe space for people to talk about business, family and personal challenges, you know, to put things out there to get some advice, feedback on, et cetera. So they're the two, I think, great features of YPO. Um, I probably have found the educational side of things more relevant than the forum side of things. I was just too busy in my day to day to really, and my first forum was, was a lot of guys with smaller startup businesses, whereas I felt my need to be around some people who'd grown billion dollar companies so that mm. I could learn from them. Mm. Um, but I am about to start up or participate in a new forum in the coming, in the next month, we're going to get a new one off the ground with people around sort of my age and vintage and um, stage of life, mm. which I think is going to be really good. But you know, you see people have been formed for 30 years and they're still meeting every month with the same group of eight to 10 people that they've been doing it with for the last 20 and 30 years. Like it's really a very powerful um, feature of the YPO um, mm. organization. So I, I would say to anyone, know, if you, if you can, if you're close to the criteria, I think they're a little bit flexible on, you know, the criteria, but if you've got a business that's growing, it's going to get over that hurdle at some point soon. Um, it's definitely, it's not cheap, but it's definitely a great organisation for entrepreneurs to be in. And also family business. There's quite a lot of family business in there and they do a lot with family business. Mm -hmm. I think that's also pretty helpful for those in family businesses. It can be a bit of a sheltered environment just being around the family. So to get out of that environment, and network with you know, a broader group of both family businesses and entrepreneurs, I think would be really valuable for people. Fantastic. It sounds very expansive because it's all about you. you I, I love that saying you become your peer group. So if you can have a peer group around you that is expansive and experienced and has done very cool things, you know, peer group and um, the community is a place to go in confidentiality and indeed the educational aspects. So yeah, yeah, great. I look forward to being a member at some point in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's worth it. <laughs> um, now what's on the horizon for you professionally over the next 12 months? Um, uh, that's a good question, Chris. I'm, um, as we spoke about earlier, uh, maybe off camera, I'm in the process of transitioning away from being sort of day-to-day -day CEO to more sort of part-time founder director. So sort of going into next year, I'll probably have, you know, a couple of days, maybe two days a week committed to Guardian to 
sort of work on the fun things, you know, from the helicopter, looking at the strategy, some acquisitions, the exit path. So I'm sort of looking forward to that transition. And, you know, it's not necessarily an easy transition, but, you know, probably two months into it, I've been amazed at how quickly I've learned not to miss all of the problem solving and all of the noise and working 80 hours a week and 100 emails a day and all that sort of stuff. So it's amazing when it's been, you know, every moment of your waking life for eight years, um, mm-hmm. you can give it up pretty quickly um, <laughs> uh, at, at a point in time. Not, not this forever, but for me, it's been um, quite good. So, so I think there'll still be that. Like I see the number one problem in our sector you know, the key pain point for all the operators is staffing, finding staff, getting them skilled up to deliver on the quality agenda that, that we have rather than just pure childcare. And so I'm sort of grappling with whether there's something to do in that space as an industry person um, um, and, and, and build something new. Um, I've, I'm a mad, I've got a huge passion for wine and wine bars, so I'm actually going to do something that really is completely different that I haven't done before. I'm going to start up a wine bar. I'm in the process of doing that right now. And, um, yeah, and maybe a bit of property development and maybe develop a few centres. So I'm sort of, um, I'm sort of, uh, what's the word? Learning to sort of let go, enjoying a little bit more of a relaxed environment and starting to think about all the possibilities nice. that are out there. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, I, I've, I've got, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to be a, full-time director and seeing yeah. all day board meetings is boring as all hell. So I want to make things happen and create things and do the things that, you know, resonate with me. Um, yep. and, and, and hopefully get to do a couple of things with my kids. My oldest daughter's doing business and IT and she's an aspiring entrepreneur and, you know, hopefully do something with her and maybe have a little bit more time for my own children because when you're the CEO of a high growth business, you really, your family does suffer enormously and, you know, I've got a 15 year old son who um, is is going through the whole teenage years and boys seem to do it a lot differently to girls and I probably need to be a bit around him a little bit more and um, uh, and so yeah I've just come back from a four day fishing trip with him and it was just a wonderful thing to do so I'm looking forward to having a little bit more time for me and my family um, as well as pursuing a few new entrepreneurial pursuits. That's fantastic. A bit of space and time. You remind me of my uncle, Martin. He built several golf courses, sold them, did all these amazing things. And and he said to me, he was retiring. He was full of it. He was full of it. He was opening restaurants and he was building another one and this and that. And I only only joke about that in, in a loving way because in that entrepreneurial spirit, that creative side, I think it's fantastic. It's, it's something you can't escape, but you can only embrace it and, you know, do some fun things with it. So that's really cool that you're, you know, living this ex- these other areas of passion with, um, you know, yeah. possibilities and also balance within family. So um, yeah. I'm very excited for you. And I think that's, um, that's a great transition that's, that you're in the middle of right now. Um, yeah, exactly. exactly. Good on you, mate. No, really. And, you know, you've got it. It's always good to know that you're getting the rewards. It's not just about money. It's also about like the reward of being able to step back a bit more and go on a fishing trip or set up a wine yeah. or whatever it is. Um, you know, the reward yeah. come through time and, and uh, knowing that you've got your solid team behind you. Um, Chris, I'll tell you a quick story. Mm. Um, this year, two acquaintances of mine died at the age of 64, okay. um, both of cancer. You know, within sort of six or nine months of being diagnosed, they died. One of them um, stopped, he was in the car business and basically sold his business to his son-in-law and took a a backseat step from about the age of 50 and for the next 14 years had a place in Queensland, travelled, played golf, spent time with his kids, spent time with his grandkids, did a few business investments Mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, unfortunately died at a, a really young age, but at mm. least for the last 14 years, he'd, he'd been able to have a pretty enjoyable life. Mm. Um, the second one was um, a former client and ultimately boss of mine who was a fantastic, one of the smartest deal doers you'll ever meet. He basically worked through cancer and all the treatment. He went to hospital um, from the office and never came out of hospital because he got an infection and four days later he passed away. And I looked at those two experiences of 
it's fun, the corporate life. It's hard work. There's money there and there's ego and prestige and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But there is also a life and mm -hmm. you don't know when it's going to be taken from you. And at some point, you know, you obviously got to work hard and create an asset and, and get yourself in a position that you've got some funds to enjoy life. And the quantum of those funds can vary depending on who you are and what your aspirations are. There's a great life to be had without a lot of money. Um, but, you know, if you get yourself in that position, you don't want to, you know, you don't have to work and work and work and die in the process because you want to have some fun and have, you know, there's a fascinating world out there today and you need to go, and, you know, play in it, I think. So, yeah, that, that I think had some impact on my thinking. You know, I turned 50 this year and to see that happen to two people I knew one really well mm. um, does make you think about the future. Yeah, it does. And, um, you know, to, to add on to the relatability of that, it was I'm 35 now and it was at the age of 25 that I lost both of my parents to a horrific accident. And so, you know, what that meant for me is that as a father now, um, mm. even though I'm building a business, I'm incredibly prioritized and present to all the moments I can, can create with my kids along the way. Because, you know, I kind of I think basically what, what we're tapping into here jointly is that that honest um, facing of what can happen in terms of mortality, um, it can really give you perspective that can give you a lot of um, gratitude um, to say, well, actually, I'm, hell, you know what, I'm going on a fishing trip or I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some traveling, it's time for me now, it's time for my family or whatever. Um, it can give you that gratitude towards those things. Um, and it also gives you indeed perspective about what it's all about in creating balance. So. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, we, we all hope that we don't have to either go through these things ourselves or for it to happen to us. Um, but, you know, even if someone hasn't had that experience yet, I hope that they can listen to these types of stories from us and, and, yeah. uh, and recognize it's very important, isn't it? Very important. Yeah, um, yeah. well, out, that's maybe, it either comes from experiencing adversity and it giving you clarity of, purpose yeah. or it just comes from maybe a bit of age and sort of yeah. seeing how the world works and being a little bit wiser from the benefit of age so oh i absolutely couldn't agree more couldn't agree more and it's usually a bit of both it's usually a bit of both um yeah. so you know well look tom it really has been a um a fascinating conversation with you there's been a lot of um a lot of heart and a lot of intellect from what we've touched upon and uh, you know i really can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast if um if people want to find um either the business or you online where can they where can they go to Sure. Um, obviously, if you're people are interested about Guardian, just look up Guardian Early Learning Group on the internet. There's a website for that sort of stuff there. And um, while I'm not an active um, uh, commentator on the world, I do have a LinkedIn page um, which you can you know see what I'm up to. And uh, if you're into bike riding, I often do quite a few posts on Instagram <laughs> of my bike riding adventures. So if anyone is sufficiently interested, they can find a few things there. And I'm even starting to dilly dally with Facebook, Chris. So, uh, um, not that I'm, uh, my wife is the queen of it. I'm just a, a, a two bit amateur. Honestly, mate, stay a two bit amateur because, you know, yes. you're, uh, you've got other stuff that you can be doing, you know, because <laughs> it's a, oh, it's a dangerous, dangerous, addictive thing. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I've avoided the addiction. So, I'm, I'm pleased about that. <laughs> fantastic tom really thank you so much for coming on today i've learned so much from this and it's been a real honor to have such a um high level of insight in terms of the the types of things that can be built so tom hardwick from the guardian uh, the guardian early learning group thank you very much for coming on today